All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Liz. Uh, I am the program and outreach specialist here at the Wood County Committee on Aging. Today, we have Carly Overstake, who is a, currently a sophomore at BGSU. She volunteered to teach this class for us today. She is currently an art education major at BGSU. So she will be talking about art history today. Go ahead, Carly. Okay, so I decided that to start us off, we should start at the very beginning. So we're going to start with cave paintings and the Paleolithic area of the time period, I guess I would say. Um, and today I just kind of said that we're gonna talk about prehistory, which if you hear me use the term prehistory, it just means a time before the invention of writing. So that means they didn't have any forms of writing. It was maybe just used using art or pictures, that kind of thing. Um, we are going to talk about mostly the Paleolithic time period, which is the old stone age with the nomadic lifestyle. I'll dive deep deeper into that in a couple of slides. And then of course, we're gonna talk about caves, their paintings and art. So at the beginning, the oldest decorative forms are like they date from Africa and some have been dated to over 100,000 years old. Um, and the oldest cave paintings have been dated to around 40,800 years ago. Um, and we know that they, come, they came from Africa because at that time period during this, that was where most of the nomads, which is what we call the people living there because they moved from, they, they never settled in one place. They moved from area to area. So if you hear the term nomadic lifestyle, that's what that means. Um, but that's where they live because that was where the temperature was pretty constant. There wasn't much changing, that kind of thing. So like I said, we're gonna focus on the Paleolithic time period. And that's, that's called the old stone age. The reason I have lithos up in, the, in some parentheses is because stone actually means lithos. So that's why it's Paleolithic, like lithic, because it's literally meaning the st old stone age. Um, it's actually divided into three main periods, the Paleolithic, the Mesolithic, and the Neolithic. But we're just gonna focus on the Paleolithic today because that is when most of the art was created and it was, that's just when most of it was made. Um, you can also dig deeper if you really want to. The Paleolithic lithic can be divided even deeper by a lower time period, a middle and an upper. All the artworks we're going to look at will be in the upper time period, um, which I don't think dates are gonna be too important. It's just gonna be like, whoa, this is, this is, this is these are old paintings, um, which is pretty cool to look at though. This slide is crazy and it's just kind of show, telling like important notes of the time period. The name, um, the Stone Age comes from the type of tools they use. So Stone Age means that they use tools for their, uh, or they use stone for their tools, um, such as hammers or digging. Um, uh, humans or Homo sapiens appeared about 400,000 years ago and modern Homo sapiens such as us occurred as early as 120,000 years ago. Um, there's a big difference there and I didn't put it in the slide, um, but I, cause I really didn't look too much into it. It's just more the modern, how we are today, our exact body and how we are built was about 120,000 years ago. Um, i trying to think if there's anything big important on here. You could think um, during this time period was the discovery of fire or light, cooking, heat, that kind of stuff. The invention of stone weapons for daggers, spear points, axes, those kinds of things. They started using a spoken language to be able to communicate with each other. But at this time, there was still no written language. There was nothing like we have today of books or even like a pictograph to be able to talk or hieroglyphics. Um, like we'll cover in the next art history lesson in next month. Um, and then it's kind of important to note that the shelters and clothing were made from animal skins and plants. Um, you'll kind of see why they were used from that because some of the paintings kind of depict 
taking down animals and hunting, which makes sense that they would then use all of the parts of the animal to help with their lives, of course. So Paleolithic artwork is most examples, or they're mostly examples found in caves. But we know that even though it was primarily sculpture and painting, in reality, this, this would have included body art, so decorations on the body and accessories. There could have been burials and ceremonies, and like I said, sculpture and painting. But because of how old this is, all we have left to look at is what has survived. And of course, we're not gonna have a painted body survive. We're gonna have what is left on the stone and what is left in the ground and built out of clay, those types of things. So to start us off, this is called the Lion Man. It was found in Baden-Württemberg, Germany, and it's considered a hybrid figure with a lion type head and a human body. We actually don't have any clue what this was used for, but since it was found near flutes and some musical instruments, we have an idea that it was probably some type of ritual. Um, this is the oldest form of artwork that we have ever found. It is between 40,000 and 28,000 years old. BCE just means before the common era, so before our time right now. And it's made of mammoth ivory. It's actually about a foot high, it's 11 inches. And so, I mean, it's not that big and it would be perfect to use as like a ritual um, or to maybe pass around in like a group setting, um, things like that. And on the next slide, we can look at, here's like some closer details. You can see over here where there's still, you can see the etching, the carvings that the artist would have used. And since this is made of mammoth ivory, that is a really strong material. And we know from how these people lived that normally people had certain jobs in the community. So this would mean that this person that made this had that certain job just to create this. And this would have taken months, if not maybe a year to a couple years, just to make this small figure. And I think it's just amazing to think that they, this was carved out of just a rock. Like they used just a rock. They didn't probably, they didn't have a special drill or anything. You can see how they even have the little area for the eyes. They took the care for the ears. Like I said, you can see the lines to try to, to help give that definition and the shape here. And I just, I just think how much that person's hands would have hurt just holding that and making sure to get all those tiny details. Um, again, we talked about how it would be used maybe for being held and passed around. You can see right here on the sides that it is worn. So it is thought that it was passed around as maybe like, look, we don't know if maybe it was looked at as a deity, as somebody, just something to help maybe on a, a hunt, like a hunting figure to look at that kind of thing. And it's just, it's just fascinating that this was touched by probably hundreds of humans just like us just thousands of years ago. But I'm a nerd for that stuff. So I think it's really cool. I think it's cool too. <laughs> <laughs> Our next piece of artwork is called Two Bison. Um, it's in a Toc de Ardubia, uh cave in France. It is about 13,000 years old. And this is actually a type of artwork we call in the round, which means that you can walk, well, oh wait, no, this isn't in the round. This is relief painting. I'm sorry about, or not painting, but relief sculpture. Sorry about that. Relief sculpture is where it's still attached to what it's made of. So it's actually still attached to that clay and that limestone and everything it's built out of, they actually just carved their way around it to give it that shape. Or they added the clay to give up those shapes and everything. And we can see it is a pretty modern depiction of what a bison would look like. They've got that hunch. You can see there's still that mane here. Um, that, I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. They were able to get this type of detail just using stone and probably maybe some wood tools, I'd assume, that type of thing or that type of thing. Very cool. Dame Ale Chapouche, I think, 
or otherwise known as Woman from Brassemapoi, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, and it was found in France. This one is about 22,000 years old. Again, this is made of ivory, similar to the mammoth ivory, but a little bit different. And what's crazy about this one is that it could fit in the palm of your hand. It is only about an inch and a half big. It is super tiny. It, <clears throat> it, you could just hold it there. But as you can see, you can see how they took the time to actually start the making it look like hair and to get that shading and that definition. Oh, um, you can see like where they etched in the eyes. Possibly there maybe have been color originally. Um, and as you see, she is broken, which means possibly had a body, but we won't know that. We don't know what she was actually used for. We don't know why she was made. Why isn't there a mouth? We don't know these answers. And it's frustrating to some like art historians because it's such an important era to learn about because this was the start of human communication with each other and being able to think how like this might last to like years and years, you know? This is one of my personal favorites. It's, cons it's called the Woman of Willendorf and it's also sometimes referred to as the Woman of Venus. And the reason she's named the Woman of Willendorf is because she was found near Willendorf. Um, she is about 28,000 to 25,000 years old, and she's actually made of limestone. This one's a little bigger. Um, she's actually about four and a little bit of almost five inches. She's pretty close. But what's crazy is that, again, we don't know the meaning of this. We can only provide inferences. So you can see here that, her, that the breasts are very enhanced and protruding off of her, but you can also see the stomach is very large and is definitely there, is definitely trying to provide emphasis on that as well as the pubic triangle. But what's baffling is that there's no face on this one. It's almost as if there's a covering on her face on purpose. So some artists, some art historians speculate that this object might have been used as a fertility god and thought, well, it doesn't matter what looks like from the head up. All that matters are these organs, the stomach to grow the body, the breast to feed and the pubic bone and pubic triangle, of course, to birth. Um, so it might have been looked at as more like of a godly figure and wanting to please those gods um, and wanting to provide a strong, maybe um, pregnancy, that type of thing. But once again, we don't know what this object means because there are no written records. You can even see here, she has her arms, they're very thin, just kind of setting on her breasts. And you just can tell that these are so, so like, I'm trying to think of the word and I can't, it's just out of my brain. Um, just the fact that they're so enlarged and trying to provide emphasis on them rather than, let's say, the face or even the fact that, that there's no feet, that type of thing. We can only speculate that these were used as fertility figures. There are more that have been found that are very similar um, to this figure, but of course, this one is the most famous. Um, and we have to remember that these were not like, this was not what a female body would have actually looked like back then. This is just what they pictured and why they enhanced and emphasized those features was for more than likely fertility. So we talked about the sculpture parts that have been found. Um, we're gonna dig more into the Paleolithic paintings. So what I want you to, I want you to visualize with me. You are a person living a nomadic lifestyle way back then, and you wanna create some artwork. So you climb up this huge side of a cliff and without using any grappling hooks or lights or um, flashlights, anything like that, you go into the deepest part of the cave. It's cold, you can't see, you don't know what's in there, just to create some artwork because that is exactly what these people did. 
they would go to the deepest, the back part of the caves. They would get into hard to reach locations. And a lot of times with these paintings, they were high off the ground. And we've actually found um, the remains of maybe some wooden uh, scaffolding that the artist would actually build in the cave to be able to reach to paint on these huge walls. Um, some locations, as we'll see later on, were used repeatedly, which means like they actually kept coming back to those areas to paint more and more, um, which this could have been like, we don't know, maybe for religious purposes or just maybe it was easy for them to get to it back then, that type of thing. You'll just notice that they used uneven rock surfaces to help them give a sense of the three dimensionality and the shading and the shadows on some of the animals we'll see. They interacted with the walls. So in some of the caves, they've actually found where it would have been like a spear got thrown at the wall and a chunk of rock has been knocked out. It's so almost maybe like it was, they were going to like on a hunting spree and they were like trying to maybe please the gods by painting this thing and then maybe some type of ritual of practicing throwing the spears at the animals on the wall. Um, some paintings were combined with engraving. So maybe they just dug out a little bit of the wall on top of the painting. And what is amazing is how incredibly lifelike these paintings are. You have to remember when we go to, when we're looking at these, they couldn't take a whole bison with them into the cave. So they were just using what they saw with their eyes and remembered to create these paintings. And you'll see it's phenomenal the, how lifelike they are and how their shading is perfect in the right areas. And the fact that they really did have a sense of how it, what you need to do to get that three dimensionality and everything with these paintings. So this is one of the paintings in Altamira. That is one of the caves in Spain. It's called Bison because as you can see, it's just a bunch of bison. Um, I think it's kind of hard to tell in this image. I have a better one on the next slide, but you can just see there is the pigments here in the just multiple bison all over. And what did you have to remember that they're, these are just covering the walls in this cave. It's high up. Um, here's another one of these bison. And you can just see how lifelike it is. I mean, we've got, they've got the horns here. They've got that arch of the back. This is kind of maybe some of the fur. There's some fur hanging off here. And even just like the shape and the shadows, um, just within the body and just, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's almost, it almost leaves me speechless. Like you just have to look at it and just, it's just phenomenal. And it's not just one like this, it's hundreds all over just, just this one cave, which there are multiple. You can look up many cave, like any Paleolithic cave and you're gonna find a bison or anything like that. Did they know what the colors were made out of? Yes, so what they would do was you, they would get maybe um, some type of like soil and they'd mix it with water and they would actually use that. Um, as for like paint brushes, what they would use was maybe their fingers to paint this or what they'd, they would make their own, um, like their own paint brushes using the bristles and the hair of animals. So what they would do for pigments, like I said, would be soil or possibly maybe like a, they might've used blood in this case because of how it's still so strong. Then again, in some cases, blood would turn brown. So it, it's, it's really hard to say exactly what they used, but it, maybe it was like a, it was certain pigments in the soil and just different things like that, if that makes sense. Like crushed up rocks. Um, so. It's amazing the color could keep. It's, well, that's when we go to the next cave um, and I'll actually, I'll go ahead. So this is the Lascaux cave and this is actually one of the most famous, but what is, what keeps the color actually is because these caves had been sealed off for years. So there was no air getting to them, like the air we breathe. Um, it was all the cave, like the 
air and the smells and the moisture that they were used to. So they were able to actually keep and it not harm them in any way. But once this cave was found, which we'll, run, we'll talk about it deeper, it was actually found in 1963. It actually closed in 1983 because of so many tourists visiting this cave that the carbon dioxide was actually harming the artworks in this cave. Um, and it was just upsetting and everyone was upset because they're like, well, we don't want to just close off this amazing history to people because they have the right to see it. So actually what they did was create an exact duplicate right next door of an exact replica of this cave and the way it's shaped and everything that you can actually still visit. So that is one way that they're able to keep that color is by limiting the amount of interaction with humans today because it would have been so different back then, the type of humans versus now. And of course, the conditions of the world are completely different now. Um, but you can just see here how it, this cave is kind of set up. This right here would be the opening. And then you kind of would walk down here. And this wouldn't be like an easy walk down. This would be like, you have to climb down cliffs. And I know that when they like were excavating this and looking into it, they had to use multiple grappling hooks. Um, they went down caverns, deep drops, small holes that only one person could fit out at a time. Um, and it's just, it's crazy to think that people used to do this just for the paintings and just to leave their mark on the world. And like maybe have, it could have been for protection. It could have been they lived there. But at the same time, there would be limited food source in there. So we almost think it's because they only went there because of the paintings. But um, you can see here going down this kind of tunnel, we'll talk about this um, set of paintings called the Great Hall of Bulls. This is one of the main attractions of this cave. Um, you'll see why it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then of course you can kind of go and there's paintings all over these walls. There's more all the way down through here. This area we're not gonna talk about, but the Chamber of Felines is what it sounds like. They have lions and there's tigers painted on the walls, those types of things. And I've not looked much into this one and we actually didn't talk about it in my art history class, but I wanna look into it more, but it's, I guess it's called the Shaft of the Dead Man. And I don't know if maybe that means there's a painting of a dead man or if maybe they found like the body like a skeleton of maybe someone that was in there. Um, so if you're pretty interested in it, you could go look into it, but <laughs> we'll go ahead and move on. This is, like I said, um, the Hall of Bulls. It is between 15,000 to 10,000 years old. And this rock in this cave in particular was limestone. This is just the painting on the limestone. Um, and I have there, the paint was made of natural pigments, so using the earth, or it could have been blood, it would have been rocks that they like kind of ground up, those kinds of things. But you can just see how massive these paintings are. This right here is, a, I mean, it's a National Geographic picture, as you can see. So there's a human right there in relation to how large these paintings are. You can, it's just, like I said, it leaves me speechless to think they did this by firelight. They did this by maybe a couple torches. They built scaffolding just to be able to reach these areas, just to leave their mark and possibly maybe have a religious ceremony, or maybe this was used again as like a hunting ritual. Like maybe they thought if they painted these, it would grant them better chances of being able to eat the next day. It's just, it's just amazing at how large these paintings are and how they were able to cover the entire space in just natural pigments and using firelight in such a cold place that's hard to reach. It's just, it's amazing that they were able to do that. So this is in Lascaux as well. It's called the Bird-Headed Man with Bison. 
And this one's between 15,000 to 13,000 years old. Again, this one's painted on limestone. This one is not as large, but it actually still is around nine inches altogether. Um, you can see here, let me move this out of the way. Um, you can see here this bison almost looks like it's maybe in battle with this bird man, as you can see. Bird kind of face with the little beak and the eyes, but then there's the body almost of a human. This is actually one of the first human forms we have seen in caves, but it almost looks as if this bison is trying to attack this man coming at him. But then you can see down here, there's like a bow and this bison is being impaled. So it almost like, almost as if he's kicking and cause his tail's up in the air, like, you know, how a, like a bull would jack and everything, almost like a rodeo. Um, and it's almost like it's coming at this, maybe a deity or this man. Um, and then there's just this random bird just sitting here with these really long line coming out. Um, I don't know if maybe that's supposed to symbolize maybe an, like a son or a child maybe even. And this right here you can see is another bull. But what you can notice between these two bulls is the different styles. You can see that this one is more just like lines. They didn't really pay much attention. This one almost looks like it has maybe a horn, like a rhino, but this that there wouldn't have been rhinos in this area. So we have to think this would be just maybe the angle again of the horns on the bull. But you can see again, like this is this those hard lines versus this one has the fur and makes it look more realistic. So we would actually know that these are painted between two different time periods, um, which makes us remember they did come back to the same areas to add more art later, like the more they went on. This one is called Chinese Horse. Um, it's between 15,000 to 13,000 years old. And the reason we have called it Chinese Horse is because it has a very similar artistic style to like Chinese culture later um, in life, not at the same time period because it wouldn't have been, but it would have been later on in history. But just that extended belly here and the really small head and the stylistic, just the stylistic devices. But this one is, um, this one's not as fun or as much movement as the other ones have, but it's still pretty important to note because some historians believe that this animal, like this painting, is where the start of notation began, like the start of maybe being able to talk with one another. So like this style, this device right here, you can see it kind of maybe looks like a, I don't know, like a, maybe like a comb you'd use maybe kind of thing. Um, some believe that that might be a um, notation marker on how to be able to talk to people. And I know it's kind of hard to see, let me see. Down here in the corner, kind of hiding right now, there's a couple of dots that are kind of connected. And some artists believe that it could be um, to be able to kind of speak with one another kind of, you can kind of see it a little bit there. I think actually, yeah, you can see them here too in the Hall of Bulls. If we, since I went back right up here, these four dots in a row, and then there's the four and the two. And some believe that that was the start of like the writing system or a way to communicate with each other. Um, this one, oh, it has those markers too, so we can talk about that. This uh, artwork is called Spotted Horses and Human Hands. It is in the Peck Merle Cave in France. You'll notice a lot of these caves are all in France and Spain because that was where these nomads were situated at that time period because just the, the, like the fertility of it and the animals there and just that was just kind of where they descended from was in Africa and everything. So it just made sense for them to travel up um, as glaciers and everything moved as well. But we do know that with this artwork, 
the horses were created first and the hands came later. So we actually know that the horses were made in 16,000 BCE. Um, and of course you can see the horses here, they're spotted, they've got manes. Um, now what is kind of odd to scientists and art, like archeologists and art historians is there spots here, but like I said, we don't know where these spots are at here. It could be a form of notation. If that's notation, how do we know for sure that this isn't notation? It's not just in the horses. Um, it's just, I don't, it's just crazy because we don't know and we'll never know because we can't, I mean, unless we get the DeLorean from Back to the Future and just go way back. I mean, I don't think we can do that though. So, um, but we can just look at these horses here and the fact that they were made first and then these hands were added about a thousand years later. And as you can see, the hands are there with then a, like a background. And the way they would actually do these hands is, um, I mean, you've probably seen it before, maybe in a classroom or something like that. They would put the hand on the wall and then they would take probably a wooden, like um, maybe like a, like a bamboo rod would be an easy one. You would hollow it out and they'd fill it with pigment and they'd spit. And so the paint would go around the hand and they were able to pull away and leave their, their handprint there. So this just makes, I feel like this is more of a personal painting to humans today because like this is a painting or this is a hand of a human. This is the same species as us today. This, this was probably a father or a mother or, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing that we can see this. And you can almost see here on this hand, it's a lot smaller and it could be from the angle, but it could also be a child's hand. I mean, you wouldn't really know unless you saw it in person. Pictures aren't gonna do justice to these paintings. Um, but it's just amazing that they were able to figure out these different styles and ways to create this art and they came up with the idea of put their hand there and spit around it, you know? Um, again, this one is on limestone and this one is massive. This one's actually 11 feet and two inches long. Um, I'm not sure about height, but just long, it's about 11 and a half feet long. It's, it's huge. Um, I'm also not sure if this one is like straight looking at or if it's gonna be more up. Normally it would be up, like I said earlier. Um, but I haven't really looked too much into this one. This paint, this is one of the only paintings really well known from this cave. So, yeah. Okay, so one of the last caves we're gonna talk about is called Chavette. And this is actually, this was actually the most recent discovered cave. It was in 1994. Um, again, it's very similar to the Lascaux Caves with all the painted chambers and galleries. What was different about this one was that there was actually animal bones that were discovered on the floor. And even though this was the most recent one found, this is actually the oldest cave. Like we've been able to date back. So this one's the oldest. And like I said earlier, like at the very beginning, imagine climbing huge cliffs to get to a cave. This is what they would climb up. And this over here hidden is where the entrance to the cave was. If you can just imagine just like, oh, let's go for a hike to make a painting. Like, here we go. Um, <laughs> I know that I would be too tired for that, but, um, but yeah, here's where that would be situated. This is one of the most famous paintings um, of the Paleolithic era in Chavette Cave, it's called Lions and Bison. It's a very odd mixture of animals, I know. Um, and it's between 30,000 and 28,000 years old. And you can see kind of over here, there's lions, and then kind of maybe chasing the bison over here, you can see those horns, and kind of one there, and there's another one with horns. And you can just easily see that movement that's going on in this painting, you can see probably they're depicting like the head going up and down of this running lion and the overlapping. And here's one, maybe it would be like set in the background. It would be like farther behind the animals, 
but they wanted to show it. So they just made it smaller within that one. You know, it like the kind of idea of background, foreground, front, like that kind of thing. And it's just the fact that they were able to get that movement without even going into great detail and show like a stampede and a hunt going on with these two different animals is beautiful. What's different about this one is that it's kind of hard to tell because there's not, there's no color. It's just that limestone on the back with, I'm not sure if it's paint or if maybe they used a charcoal because over here it almost seems like it's smeared, kind of like a charcoal would, but then the defining lines make it seem like it could be a paint of some sort of pigment. Um, but it's just, it's just beautiful to look at. Plus the idea of bison being in the same area of lions is kind of crazy, but that's, that's what they dealt with. That was just two of the animals they dealt with. I mean, they had mammoths back then too, because of the one, the lion man being made of a mammoth ivory. I mean, it's just crazy. Um, I think this is the last artwork we're going to talk about today. This is called Three Bears, and it's in the Chavette Cave, and it's in the area considered recess of the cave. So it's actually a recess of the bears. So this area is all just a bunch of bears that they've painted. And again, um, you can see that they were able to get that definition, that shape of what a bear would look like and what bears look like today even. Um, there's not as much color with these ones, but that still doesn't take away, like it, there's still so much beauty to these and the shapes and the forms and everything. Um, you can only see two bears in this picture, but I'm pretty sure there's another one on the back, kind of like they're following it in a line. That's just another picture of how they blowing of the hands. Um, is there any questions that I can try to answer? If not, it's totally fine. I don't like <laughs> to ask questions either. So. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for Carly? A lot to take in. It was very yeah. interesting. It is. I, and that's, I even broke it. Like, I didn't even give you everything I could have. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was really interesting. Thank you very much, Carly. Oh, of course. Yeah. I hope you join back in December when we do Egyptian art. Oh, yes. Yeah. That one's going to be pretty yeah. fun. Yeah. So Carly will also be back next week. Um, she's going to lead a painting for us. So um, if you're interested in that, you can sign up. We'll deliver the supplies to you. Um, and then she's going to do a cute little turkey painting with us and walk us through that. And then she'll be, she'll be back in December to do the same thing. She's going to do a art history presentation one week and then a, a winter painting the next week with us. So Thank you so much, Carly. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank, Thank you. you for doing all of these for us. We really appreciate it. And you did a great job. I appreciate it too. It gets me, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to be a teacher. So it helps me <laughs> kind of relax and have fun. I mean, yeah, I'm excited to do it one day. So yep. yeah, of course. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you.